This is Physics 1060 Descriptive Astronomy, Lecture 14. Today we're going to be going through Chapter 15. So this is the introduction to galaxies, and the amount of time that I'm going to spend on this topic is quite unrelated to the amount of research that's currently being done. This is actually one of the most active areas of astronomy. I'll give you the outline to point you towards some unsolved problems, but it is much more difficult to teach basic scientific principles using the subject of galaxies. A galaxy is an immense and relatively isolated cloud of hundreds of millions to hundreds of billions of stars and vast amounts of interstellar gas. Each star moves in its own orbit, guided by the gravity generated by the other stars in the galaxy. Now, Beyond the Milky Way are millions, if not billions, of other galaxies. Some galaxies are spiral like the Milky Way, while others are egg-shaped or completely irregular in appearance. Besides shape, galaxies vary greatly in the star, gas, and dust content, and some are more active than others. Galaxies tend to cluster together, and these clusters appear to be separating from each other, caught up in a universe that is expanding. The why for all this diversity is as yet unanswered. Now, since galaxies are so far away, only a few can be seen without the aid of a telescope. Andromeda and the large and small Magellanic clouds. In the 18th century, Charles Messier catalogued several fuzzy objects to be avoided in comet searches. Many turned out to be galaxies. For example, M31, the Andromeda Galaxy, is one example of this. Here we see two small galaxies that are actually in orbit around the larger Andromeda Galaxy. In the 19th century, William Herschel and others systematically mapped the heavens, creating the new general catalog, which included many galaxies. Here we see the large and small Magellanic clouds which are satellite galaxies to our own galaxy. Now there are three major classes of galaxies, with the first two being the most important. By the 1920s, Edwin Hubble demonstrated that galaxies could be divided on the basis of their shape into three types and two subtypes. Our Milky Way is a typical, fairly large spiral galaxy. So here's some pictures of spirals. Notice the spiral galaxy has another little spiral that's in orbit around it. Now, spirals have these spiral arms that come out. Uh, in this case, this has many spiral arms. Well, in this case, this ga spiral galaxy only has two. So we have to be able to classify between the different types of spiral galaxies. Here are a few more spiral galaxies that we see. This one has many different arms. This spiral galaxy, we're looking at edge-on. And you notice that there's some extinction due to the dust in the galaxy hiding a lot of what it is. But we can see the nuclear bulge of the galaxy and the disk of the galaxy. More spiral galaxies. This one, again, we can see uh, the disk of the galaxy. This one is slightly tilted to us and it's actually called the sombrero galaxy. Kind of looks like a sombrero. So spiral galaxies have two or more arms winding out from the center. And they're classified with a letter S followed by a letter A through D to distinguish how large the nucleus is or how wound up the arms are. Some spiral galaxies have bars that are part of the spiral pattern. Here I have what looks like a bar, a straight line going across the center before I get to the spiral part of the galaxy. Arms emerge from the ends of the elongated central region, or bar, rather than the core of the galaxy. These are classified SB, followed by the letters A through D. These were thought by Hubble to be a separate class of object from the normal S spirals, and computer simulations show bar may be the result of close encounters between two different galaxies. The Milky Way is probably an SB galaxy. Now the next is an elliptical galaxy, and they have much less rotation than spiral galaxies. They're a bit like giant globular clusters with little interstellar matter and very few young stars. Elliptical galaxies are rather just like the halo component of spiral galaxies. Elliptical galaxies range from more massive than the large spiral galaxies to much, much smaller. They're classified according to how elliptical they are, although that's kind of hard to determine. Elliptical galaxies are smooth and featureless in appearance and generally have some sort of elliptical shape. They're classified with the letter E, followed by a number of 0 through 7 to express the flatness of the elliptical shape. Here we see 
a picture of an elliptical galaxy, or in this picture, uh, the Hubble Deep Space, we see lots of galaxies out there, some of which are ellipticals, some of which are spirals. So the classification scheme, is, which you don't need to know, uh, what I really want you to know is spiraled, bar spiraled, ellipticals, and irregular, which we'll talk about in a second. But essentially the A through D specifies how tightly wound the spirals are. Or in the elliptical, the 0 through 7, uh, 0 would be a spherical, uh, 7 would be a very flattened elliptical. The last type of galaxy are regular galaxies. Neither arms nor uniform appearance, generally stars and gas clouds are scattered in random patches. They're classified as IRR. The large and small Magellanic clouds are irregular galaxies. They're not elliptical, they're not spiral, they're just um, an isolated patch of stars that haven't quite formed a good shape yet. Now S0 galaxies are classified as irregular. They're disk systems, but no evidence of arms. They were thought by Hubble to be intermediate between S and E galaxies. Several theories now explain, um, or try to explain their appearance. Uh, S0 lacks gas to produce the O and B stars that light up the spiral arms that might exist, we just might not be able to see them. So Hubble has a sort of tuning fork, and he proposed that this tuning fork from elliptical off to different spirals was a hypothesis for galactic evolution. Today, it's believed this interpretation is incorrect. We still use this classification scheme, but galaxies don't go from spherical to elliptical to spirals. In fact, um, it's more likely that they go from spirals to elliptical. So to classify the different types of galaxies, we have spirals that have a mixtulation of population and population two stars. The interstellar content is about 15% by mass in the disk. Ellipticals are basically only population two. Blue stars are very rare. And the interstellar content is very low density, very hot gas. In irregulars, we have blue stars are very common. And the interstellar content can be as much as 50% of the mass of the galaxy. A few other items to note. Ellipticals have a large range in sizes from globular cluster sizes to a hundred times the mass of the Milky Way. A census of galaxies nearby say that most are dim dwarf galaxies and dwarf irregular galaxies, uh, sparsely populated with stars. A census of distance galaxies and clusters, 60% of the members are spirals and SO, while sparsely populated regions, it might be up to 80%. And early or very young galaxies are much smaller than the Milky Way. The merging of these galaxies is thought to have resulted in the larger galaxies of today. So spirals in general rotate relatively faster than ellipticals. The rotation speed of ellipticals of different flattening shows little or no relation to the rotational speed. So the consequence is rotation plays a role in galaxy types, but other factors probably do also. Some other factors, computer simulations show galaxies formed from gas clouds with large random motions becoming ellipticals, whereas small random motions became spirals. Ellipticals had high star formation rate in the brief period after their birth, while spirals produced stars over longer periods of time. The question is, did the rate cause the type or did the type cause the rate? Now, could galaxies' type change in time? Certainly, computer simulations show a galaxy shape can change dramatically during a close encounter or a collision with another galaxy. This computer simulation shows two spiral galaxies that collide, and as they go through each other, we get um, the galaxies uh, that throw off arms and eventually become an elliptical. We actually see in space something that looks exactly like what we saw in this computer simulation. These are two galaxies that are in the act of colliding. Now, in a collision between galaxies, individual stars are fairly much left unharmed. Remember, most of the space is empty, so they pretty much move right through each other. However, any gas or dust clouds, as they go through each other, they will have all of a sudden enough density to collapse in and we get a burst of star formation. A small galaxy may alter the stellar orbits of a large galaxy to create something called a ring galaxy. Evidence 
uh, faint shell-like rings and dense clumps of stars of spirals colliding and merging form ellipticals. So ring galaxies are probably formed as two galaxies collide. This picture is of the Cartwheel Galaxy. It's 500 million light years away from the Milky Way Galaxy. It has a center elliptical galaxy with spokes with a ring of material around the outside. It's not unique. We see other ring galaxies out there. Uh, this ring galaxy, we're seeing the elliptical center and the ring um, on the side. Uh, here we have a very nice ring with a center elliptical in the, in the middle. So there's evidence for galaxy type change via collisions and merger over time. On a large scale, small galaxies may be captured and absorbed by large galaxies in a process called galactic cannibalism. It explains abnormally large ellipticals in the center of some galaxy clusters. The Milky Way actually appears to be swallowing the Magellanic clouds, while Andromeda shows rings and star clumps of swallowed galaxies from the past. And if we look at very distant clusters, they have the higher proportion of spirals than near clusters. Distant clusters contain more galaxies within a given volume. So distant galaxies show more signs of disturbance by neighboring galaxies, odd shapes, bent arms, twisted disks, what astronomers call harassment. So now let's talk about distances to galaxies. The typical distances are measured in megaparsecs, or millions of parsecs. The nearest major galaxy is the Andromeda Galaxy. It's 670 kiloparsecs away, or about 2 million light years. So any of the light we see from the Andromeda Galaxy is light that came off of the stars 2 million years ago. The farthest known galaxies are about 4,000 megaparsecs, or about 14 billion light years away, and they're really just faint spots of light. Now, galaxies are too far away to employ parallax techniques. So instead, we use the method of standard candles. The standard candles are usually Cepheid variable stars, or supergiant stars, planetary nebulas, supernovas, etc. So by looking at a Cepheid in another galaxy, we know from its rate of pulse exactly what its brightness is. And we compare that with something, say, even in our own Milky Way with a known distance. And we can use the same uh, inverse square law uh, standard candles methods to figure out the distance to that far galaxy. Now, in 1911, Hubble discovered that all galaxies, with just a few exceptions, are moving away from the Milky Way. And Edwin Hubble found that these radial speeds, which just means coming towards us or away from us, calculated by a Doppler shift analysis, which we call recessional velocity, and that recessional velocity increases with a galaxy's distance from us. From a plot of several galaxies' known recessional velocities and their distances, Hubble discovered a simple formula, that the velocity is equal to the Hubble constant times the distance it is away. Today, that expression is called Hubble's law, and the slope of this line, or h, is called the Hubble constant. Now, it's not completely agreed upon. Uh, these measurements are very difficult to do. But it's about 72 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So, with h known, one can turn this around and determine the galaxy's unknown distance by measuring its recessional velocity and using h. So now all we need to know is how fast it's moving away from us and we can and we can do that using redshift we can figure out exactly how far away it is now hubble's law is the only method that there is for most of the galaxies in the universe now later we're going to talk about cosmology or the study of the cosmos as a whole and we'll discuss the implications of hubble's law on the universe now there's some other methods we have for determining distances. One is the image graininess. The smoother the distribution of stars in a galaxy, the further away it is. Or the tolley fisher method, which says the higher the rotational speed of the galaxy, the more luminous it is. And the interrelationship of all these distant measuring techniques is called the distance ladder. So now that we have a way of measuring how far away something is, we can use 
um, this angular width in the sky to determine the diameter of the galaxy. So if we know then this angular width on a telescope and we know its distance, we can solve for little d, the diameter of the galaxy. Now the main way of determining the mass of a galaxy is to do more or less what we did with our own galaxy. We measure the orbits of stars and use Kepler's laws. Now, galaxies rotate far too slowly for us to see any actual motions, but what we can do is measure the Doppler shift of the stars at different distances from the center of the galaxy. This actually tells us how the mass is distributed in a galaxy. And the total masses are about up to 10 to the 13th times the mass of the Sun, or 10 trillion solar masses. But there are a lot of smaller ones, down to just 10 to the 8th solar masses. Now when we study these rotation curves of spiral galaxies, we often get a strange result. There seems to be extra mass that is not producing light than we'd expect if the matter were all in the form of normal stars. We call that extra mass dark matter. This is a major mystery in astronomy right now. And there are signs that there are actually 3 to 10 times more dark matter than regular matter in galaxies. Later, we're going to talk about a couple more bits of evidence for dark matter. Now, again, dark matter is not some exotic, strange thing. It's just something out there that doesn't shine light. That's why we call it dark. Most of the mass that we see is due to stars which shine light. We just can't see this dark matter. We know it's there because of its gravitational pull. Now, the center of some galaxies emit abnormally large amounts of energy from a very tiny region in their core. And the emitted radiation usually fluctuates. In many instances, intense radio emission and other activity exists well outside the galaxy that come from these cores. Centers of active galaxies are referred to as AGN, active galactic nuclei. 10% of all galaxies we see are active. And of the active galaxies, we have three overlapping classes. We have radio galaxies, Seifert galaxies, and quasars. Radio galaxies are typically elliptical galaxies, and they emit radio energy. And it, that energy comes from the core and regions symmetrically located outside the galaxy. The outside regions are called radio lobes, and they may span hundreds of millions of light years. And the core itself may be less than a light month across, as opposed to the size of a galaxy, which could be 50,000 light years across. And these lobes can actually be swept back as this gal galaxy in the center is moving through the universe, and the material out here interacts with the intergalactic dust and matter that's out there, similar to what we have between stars, and so it's swept back. Now, the energy in these is as much as a million times more than a normal galaxy. The radio emission is synchrotron radiation. High-speed electrons are generated in the core and shoot out via jets in the direction of the lobes. These high-speed electrons eventually collide with surrounding gas and spread out to form lobes. In this radio galaxy, this little white dot in the center is the galaxy. The lobes, which are much bigger than the galaxy, come out um, symmetrically from each side. Now, Seifert galaxies are spiral galaxies with abnormally luminous nucleus. The nucleus can actually put out as much energy as the Milky Way. So, an entire galactic amount of light coming from a very small region in the center. That region of emission is less than a light year across. And the wavelength of these light emissions range from the infrared to x-rays. And it fluctuates rapidly, sometimes changing in just a few minutes. They also contain gas clouds moving at high speeds. And occasionally the gas is ejected in small jets. So we have rapidly moving gas and small bright nucleus make Seifert galaxies similar to radio galaxies. And in fact, some Seifert galaxies are radio galaxies as well. And the last of these are quasars. Quasars have the largest redshift of any astronomical object. So they're, if the largest redshift means they're moving faster away from us than anything else. 
and Hubble's law then implies that they are the furthest distances from us, as much as 10 billion light years away. To be visible at those distances, they must be a thousand times or more luminous than the entire Milky Way. Now, there are some that are similar to radio galaxies in emissions. Others are similar to radio and Seifert galaxies in that they eject hot gas from the centers. And we have superluminal motion in the jets indicate extreme high-speed motions. Recent images reveal quasars often lie in faint, fuzzy-looking objects that appear to be ordinary galaxies. Based on the output fluctuations, quasars resemble the AGNs of radio galaxies and Seifert galaxies in that they're small, say fractions of a light year across in some cases. Now this leads us to another way of determining the diameter of an astronomical object just using light variability. This is going to use three assumptions. The rate at which light is emitted from an active region is the same everywhere in that region. The second is the emitting region completely defines the object of interest. In other words, there's no dead areas of significance. And the last one, which is a very safe bet, is that the speed of light is finite. So the light variation, then, is just a measure of the time it takes light to travel across the active surface. Multiplying the time by the speed of light gives the size of the emitting object. So I have some object here. <clears throat> it has a certain size. I don't know what it is. It's too far away to measure. But I'm going to assume that everything in here changes its light output at the same time. So, if I'm looking at a brightness curve, the brightness curve, so as a light from A, as it gets brighter, it starts to increase. As we get more and more light throughout the whole thing, and finally when we get to B, all of it occurs, and it's at this new brightness. So the amount of time it takes here, times the speed of light, gives us the diameter of this object that's changing its brightness. Now why do we get this activity in galaxies? All active galaxies have many features in common. So that suggests that there may be a single model to explain all of them. Such a model must explain how a small region can emit an extreme amount of energy over a broad range of wavelengths. The model must be unusual, since no ordinary star could be so luminous, nor could enough ordinary stars be packed into such a small volume. So our basic model is that we have a black hole about the size of the Earth with a gas accretion disk tens to hundreds of astronomical units across. As the gas in the accretion disk is drawn towards the black hole, it increases its temperature to millions of degrees Kelvin. Now, some of the gas is trapped by the magnetic field and ejected off at super high speeds on either side of this black hole. The accretion gas is replenished by nearby passing stars or material from collisions with another galaxy. So how do we get a massive black hole in the center of the galaxies? Well, we have a massive star in a densely populated core of galaxy explodes, and it forms a black hole, maybe a five solar mass black hole. And the black hole is going to continue to grow from the accretion of interstellar matter. And as the radius of the black hole increases, it makes capture of more material easier. Eventually, the black hole becomes large enough to swallow entire stars around it. And at this point, the growth of the black hole is exponential until equilibrium with all available materials stops the growth. So how do we know this? What's our observational proof? Well, the extremely high speeds of gas and stars at very small distances from the galactic center requires a huge mass to be there, on the order of millions of solar masses. Yet this mass emits no radiation of its own. All galaxies appear to have massive black holes at their centers. Now, not all galaxies are active, especially older ones. And this is because the central source of material that the black hole is gobbling up is diminished. And a one-to-one -one relationship of central black hole mass to bulge size could mean the black hole existed before the rest of the galaxy material surrounded it. Other theories of AGNs exist, but none is well accepted 
as the black hole model. Now one of the things about quasars, because they are so far away, it allows the light from that quasar to be used as probes for any intervening material. Quasar absorption lines have very different Doppler shifts from the emission lines of the quasars themselves. It's an indicator of cool gas clouds between the quasar and Earth. And a quasar's light may also be affected by a gravitational lens. So quasars are very bright and very far away. And as the light from a quasar passes by a massive object, it can be bent in the, much the same way that light is bent as it goes through a glass lens. The bending of light by gravity is a prediction of Einstein's general theory of relativity. And the bending light creates multiple quasar images and arcs that can be used to determine the mass of a massive object. So for example, here we have a very distant galaxy. Behind it is a quasar. These four objects here are all the same object. And we can tell by the type of light that comes out, uh, any fluctuations, it's always the same. So they're all the same. The quasar is actually behind the central galaxy and what we're seeing as the light comes it is bent around that galaxy and refocused down to where we can see it as four separate objects. So here we have the galaxy that's in between here we have the quasar, and here we have Earth. So, some of the light might try to go right through the galaxy, but quasars shine light in all different directions. So some of it's coming out here, and as it goes by this galaxy, it gets bent. And so as we see it, it appears to be here. Or another path might come here, and so we appear see it here. The quasar, there's only one of them, is actually here. But we see multiple images due to the light bending around the galaxy, and we call that a gravitational lens. Now the next thing I want to talk about is clusters of galaxies. Galaxies are actually found in clusters of galaxies even more than stars are found in clusters of stars. Nearly every galaxy we see is in a cluster. The Milky Way belongs to a very small cluster that we call the local group. It contains about 30 members with the three largest members being the spiral galaxies M31, M33, and the Milky Way. Most of the local group galaxies are faint, small dwarf galaxies, ragged, disorganized collections of stars with very little or no gas that can't be seen in other clusters. The Maginot Clouds are in our local group. The large Maginot Cloud is about one-tenth of the mass of our galaxy. It's in orbit around us. The Andromeda Galaxy, which we've talked about, about 2 million light years away. Again, depending on how you add it, there's about 20 to 30 members of the local group. So here's some pictures of M33, M31. There's some dwarf galaxies here. We have the Milky Way with the Maginot Clouds around it. So as we look out in the sky, we see that the galaxies are found in these clusters. Now, galaxies within these clusters are held together by their mutual gravity. And typical cluster size is several million light years across and contain a handful to some that have several thousand galaxies. Now, this galactic cluster is actually lensing something behind it. We can see it. See, we have these arced objects in here. These are all objects that are behind this cluster of galaxies as the light's coming around is lensed and so from these arcs then we're actually able to measure the mass of the cluster. Now the largest groups of galaxies contain hundreds to thousands of member galaxies. Large gravity puts galaxies into basically a spherical distribution. They contain mainly elliptical and SO galaxies. Spirals just tend to be on the fringes of the cluster. Giant ellipticals tend to be near the center. We think this is due to cannibalism. They contain large amounts of mass, um, maybe 10 to the 12th or 10 to the 14th solar masses of extremely hot X-ray emitting gas with very little heavy elements. Here's a picture of the Hercules cluster of galaxies. Most of the objects that we see here are galaxies. Here we have two galaxies that are in the act of colliding. 
And we have elliptical galaxies, we have spiral galaxies, uh, just a very rich, um, diverse group of galaxies. These are other clusters of galaxies that we see. Uh, we see several good ellipticals and spirals, or this one, another two galaxies that are in the act of colliding. Now, poor clusters have only a dozen or so member galaxies. They're ragged, have an irregular look. There's a high proportion of spirals and irregulars. Our own local group is a poor cluster. Now, in general, all clusters need dark matter to explain the galactic motions and the confinement of hot intergalactic gas within the cluster. Near clusters appear to have their members fairly smoothed out, while far away clusters, and therefore younger because its light's taken longer to get there, so we're looking at them as they were a long time ago, are more ragged looking. This suggests that clusters form by galaxies attracting each other into groups as opposed to clustering forming out of a giant gas cloud. Now, as we look out there, what we see is that clusters aren't the largest object we see. We also have clusters of clusters, and we call those superclusters. So a group of galaxy clusters can be gravitationally attracted to each other into a larger structure called a supercluster. It contains a half dozen to several dozen gal gal galaxy clusters spread over tens to hundreds of millions of light years. Our local group belongs to the local supercluster. Superclusters have irregular shapes and are themselves part of even larger groups. We have one that's called the Great Wall. It's a, um, a lot of superclusters that are sprung out in a wall. And there's another supercluster we call the Great Attractor. And so our local supercluster cluster contains us, the local group, and the M81 group, the M101 group, the Virgo cluster, the Ursa Major cluster, over a span of about a hundred million light years. So now as we start to look at the very largest things out there, and the structure of the universe itself, we have this map here. This map shows a small portion of the sky, and every little blue dot we see here is a galaxy. And we see strings of galaxies uh, forming superclusters or, or the clumpiness getting together in a larger thing. So this would be uh, a cluster of superclusters. So there's a lot of structure in the universe, and we're trying to understand why. Why is it not just everything smoothly distributed everywhere? Why do we have all this clustering? And that is one of the mysteries and problems that cosmologists are trying to determine.